Um, welcome to Spirit. Um, it's our interfaith happy hour conversation. And tonight we're going to be here um, with Father Joshua Shawnee from uh, St. Jerome's. What what congregation is St. Jerome? What's the type of church is it? So Saint, uh, the parish church of St. Jerome is a uh, free and independent Catholic community. Um, it's an intentional Eucharistic community. So it is a a church that worships and very much believes and practices within the historic Catholic tradition, uh, but it's free from both the Roman Catholic diocese and the Episcopal diocese. It's an, it's a fully independent uh, lay governed parish. Perfect. Love it. I'm, I am an Episcopalian, um, raised Southern Baptist. Uh, seems to be very common. Uh, raised Southern Baptist is a common phrase in the LGBTQ plus community here in Oklahoma, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm an Episcopalian now and I, I love, um, I love a Eucharistic service. So I feel like I would, I would love to go to St. Jerome. And, yeah, and yeah, you would find them very similar. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I've heard wonderful things about St. Jerome. Um, uh, so many of our constituents attend St. Jerome. Um, many have sung in the, in the choir there. Right. Um, that many, many of my friends have sung at St. Jerome. Well, good. I sing in the choir at Trinity. Oh, nice. Um, okay, so church. yes, it, yes. Um, welcome everybody. Welcome. Uh, I see we've got some people watching. Um, again, uh, just, just as a reminder for everybody, you are more than welcome to submit your comments in the chat and we will uh, be monitoring the chat and make sure that your questions are answered. Um, if you have any today, just remember as we're talking, if you have any converse, any uh, questions or comments about um, LGBTQ plus spirituality, so that's, you know, the intersections of our LGBTQ plus identity and faith, um, and that can be relating to any aspect of your faith, um, you are welcome to comment. We're here to have um, just some interesting conversation, really. Um, so we're happy you're here today. Um, all right, it is six o'clock. Welcome everybody to Spirit um, Interfaith Conversations on Faith and Sexuality. My name is Morgan Allen White, and I'm still getting used to saying uh, White again. Uh, and I am happy to be here today. I'm the Center Director at Oklahoma for Equality, the Dennis Arneal Equality Center. And um, I'm here today with Father Joshua Shani from St. Jerome's Church, and uh, we're just going to have a really good discussion, and I'm going to let uh, uh, Father Joshua introduce himself. Uh, hi. Uh, first, I'm so very happy to be here with Morgan today. Thank you for the kind invite. i uh, very excited to have this conversation with you. Uh, as Morgan mentioned, uh, my name is Father Joshua Shani. I'm the uh, parish priest and pastor of the Parish Church of St. Jerome. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I do identify as queer, um, so I'm really happy to be here today. The Parish Church of St. Jerome, if you don't know, um, is an independent Catholic community, which is kind of rare these days. Uh, so we uh, worship and very much believe and practice our faith in the Catholic tradition, uh, but we are free of Rome, uh, free of any other uh, diocese or, or communion. Uh, we are a lay-led parish, uh, very excited to be serving this community, and we are actually celebrating 25 years of inclusive and egalitarian Catholic ministry this year. So it's a banner year for us. We're very excited uh, about that and, and to be engaging with, uh, with a larger LGBTQI community here in Tulsa. Well, congratulations on 25 years of worship in, in Tulsa. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, St. Jerome is really one of the churches we think of. Um, I think of that first comes to mind when I think of a welcoming and affirming church. And so what does it really mean to you uh, to be a welcoming congregation? And what does it mean? Uh, what is being welcomed in the church really look like? Yeah, so that's a really good question because uh, so many churches these days kind of uh, think and, and, and strive to practice to be welcoming uh, and affirming St. Jerome's is one of the early ones here in Tulsa to really em embrace uh, the great diversity that uh, the God ordained and God given diversity uh, that exists in both the church and in the world. Um, so we've always affirmed uh, women in ministry. We've had women priests here at this parish and, and celebrate uh, women's giftedness for ministry. So we are an egalitarian community of faith. 
Uh, we also started as a LGBT affirming and predominantly LGBTQI uh, community of faith as well. And we celebrate, of course, the ministry of our LGBTQI brothers and sisters as well uh, at all levels of ministry from, from Bishop all the way down to Acolyte. Um, so uh, as we've grown and, and evolved over the last 25 years, uh, we've actually become more and more diverse. Uh, so we are a purple congregation. We cover the political spectrum. Um, we very much represent the community in which we exist um, with a, a great deal of racial and uh, ideological and uh, diversity and, and background. And for us being inclusive uh, means embracing and accepting everyone where they're at. Um, and one of the ways that we really strive to practice that in the Parish Church of St. Jerome is we have open communion. Uh, if you come forward and, and you feel called to the communion table, we, we invite you to share within that. Um, and so we embrace that diversity um, and celebrate it as, as part of the richness that God has given us uh, within the created world and seek to make it a place where everyone is welcome. Uh, the table is open to everyone. Ministry is open to everyone. Uh, knowing, in fact, that um, that diversity makes us better and makes us stronger. Um, and it really helps us to um, typify and become what we understand is the dominion of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's that's really great. It really reminds me of um, what, what I like to think when I think of welcoming and, and inclusion in the church is, you know, there, there's really there really can be no... Um, welcome place without representation within the leadership right right um i i just i really think like that's one of the things where if you're looking for a good place to start it's by asking those who are kind of already in your church to 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 step up and um and ask them ask them the questions ask them you know to take on these positions and if you don't openly affirm you know if you're if you're looking for a good place to start affirming positions of leadership within your church um deacon acolyte um sunday school leader um and and whatever your faith may be um just saying yes you can take on these leadership roles um as an lgbtqia plus person um because when you when you see that and you see that you can you can lead within your within your faith community that's where you're saying, oh, okay, I really am welcome here. They're not going to try and ask me to not be me in order to thrive here, in order to um, really, really serve, yeah. you know? Yeah, and for us, that's one of the primary differences between just being welcoming and being affirming. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of places are welcoming. They'll, they'll be happy to have you come sit in the pew and put some money in the plate, uh, but you know they don't want you to serve in leadership roles or you're not welcome to seek ordination. And so for us, we're not just welcoming, uh, we affirm the giftedness uh, in ministry and calling to ministry of, of everyone, um, despite their sexual orientation or their gender identity, um, all are truly welcome and affirmed and called into ministry within our, within our community of faith. Because I, I think it takes all, it takes all walks of life and all backgrounds and all all of those intersections of um of identity that we have to truly understand um what our what our earth is all about what our what what it is that we've been you know created and called to do um because one person's experience like if we create this like monolith of uh, what it means to be the perfect minister, what it means to be the perfect person doing doing this work, then we're negating a lot of experiences in the world, right? And I, I just think it's really important to um, call upon all walks of life, all experiences um, to be a part of ministry. It, it just it takes it takes us all to figure out this the complex meaning of of spirituality Absolutely. um yeah so okay, i'm just trying to figure out how i want to kind of ask this question what order i want to ask them so um 
So do you all talk about LGBTQ plus identity within your church as a topic? And, and if so, why do you feel like it's important to talk about LGBTQ plus identity within, within the church? Yeah, um, so erasure and invisibility has been a really big problem uh, within the queer community, particularly in uh, communities of faith. Um, it's what we call, I come from an archival science background, uh, it's what we call a silent history. Um, we know, of course, you know, just obviously uh, queer persons, LGBTQI persons, um, have participated in community uh, communities of faith since the beginning of time, but so often their stories have gone unrecorded and untold, and so we're really um, proud of our diversity, we're proud of our identity as an open and affirming congregation, uh, and we find it really important to name those people, to name their contributions uh, to the Christian story, to the Christian tradition, uh, to name their presence as beloved children of God and, and ministers uh, in Christ's church, uh, particularly within the priesthood of all believers, um, and then, of course, in ordained and lay ministries as well. Uh, so that is a step in the right direction for making those voices heard, uh, for centering those unique perspectives, those, those important religious stories, and to providing testimony for how God is using these lives uh, to bring mercy and grace and love and peace into the world. That's such a, that's such a great answer. And I, I like the idea of, of being able to pull the history and especially the biblical history. Mm. I think I think that is definitely what you call the silent history. We 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 often hear of um we we often hear that there 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 is no representation in the Bible mm. of LGBTQ plus persons and and um that is simply not true. <laughs> right, um right. Uh, uh, biblically speaking and um it's important to name to name that and to uh, and to tell uh, those seeking faith and 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 even those recovering um, from any spiritual harm or abuse that they may have that um, those words used against them uh, that is not that is not uh, spiritually accurate mm. and that and that they they are valid and and, and seen in the Bible. Yeah, and, and in a real and meaningful way, what we're doing is nothing new. Um, like you're saying, queer persons have a place within scripture. You know, we've kind of tried to write them out of history. Um, there are many saints uh, in the church's history that we would now identify as being on the queer spectrum. Um, and so we're well represented in scripture. We're well represented in history. And naming those communities and naming that experience is so vital, I think, uh, to reclaiming the queer identity as, as being made in the image of God. Mm. So um, you've mentioned uh, affirming leadership within your um, church and, and from the get-go um, having LGBTQ plus people not only welcomed but um, celebrated within the church. Can you tell me what other practices that you do at St. Jerome that kind of ensure LGBTQ plus members are, are welcome in your space and, and stuff that kind of really excites you. Yeah, so uh, the most important thing we do as Catholics, our life is centered around the sacraments. Uh, and so we extend the sacraments to all people uh, through a charism of mercy. Um, from, from the get-go, we've uh, extended, you know, communion to, div to divorced Catholics and uh, communion to um, all people. Like I mentioned, the sacrament of marriage is extended uh, to all people within our community of faith. We also strive as much as we can uh, to make sure things like our vestry and our leadership, uh, our elected and, and nominated leadership within this community of faith uh, represent our diversity, represent uh, the vast array and richness of who we are as a people of faith. I um, mean that, that, you know, we're constantly asking the question of how can we welcome more? Uh, how can we open the doors wider? Who do we need to reach that is not being wel welcomed in other faith communities. So um, it's been our charism from the beginning to be opening and affirming. It's something that we continually grow uh, on and, and with in the hopes that uh, we can become even more diverse uh, racially and ethnically, more diverse uh, in socioeconomic way, uh, ways, more diverse in uh, theology and spiritual practice and uh, making that the core of who we are and yet also the constant goal of where we're trying to go has always been of vital importance here. And it's one of the reasons that I was drawn here uh, as a child, I kind of grew up, I came here at the age of 15. Uh, so it was kind of raised up by this parish and why I came back as an adult uh, to serve this particular community of faith. 
So if other church leaders or, or, or faith communities were looking to, to kind of model their church to be more affirming, what advice would you, would you want to give them? Um, I would say that the, all of the skills, all of the talents, the people that they need to do that probably already exist within their congregation. Um, one of the great strengths that we have here at the Parish Church of St. Jerome um, is that we are a lay-led congregation. We're led by a vestry. Um, this is really a church of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, uh, I am an ordained leader here and ha serve a very particular function. Uh, but our, our people, our parish, lead and govern and guide themselves. And so uh, our open and affirming stance uh, is an organic process, is an organic result of who we are as a community of faith. Um, and so the first thing I would encourage uh, ordained leaders to do is to get out of the way, uh, to not center themselves, uh, to center their community of faith, to talk about who matters to them, who they represent, who's in their family, and who they want to be as a community of faith. And then as a minister, to become the resource person to make that happen, to really empower that lay ministry, to really empower that community, to define for itself who it is and who it wants to minister to. So that's where I would encourage uh, pastors and ordained leaders, get out of the way. Uh, let your people be who they are and celebrate those things. I think that's really, really great advice. Um, now, a, a very common thing that we see in churches and and within um, within the faith community, and 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 you probably had it within Saint Jerome, is is that loved ones of LGBTQ plus people and, and and congregation members struggle themselves to reconcile faith and um, sexuality. And so, do you have some uh, some advice that you would give those loved ones um, that that would help them? you know, really reconcile these two things that, that to them feel so um, at odds with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a particular struggle that all, I think, inclusive and affirming communities of faith have. It's something that we share across denominational and, and worship lines. Um, here at St. Jerome's, the, I would say the majority of people that we have have experienced some form of religious trauma. Um, they've been excluded from their communities of faith for one reason or another or made to feel uh, unwelcome. And that's not just the LGBTQI community. Uh, we have divorced Catholics among us. We have those uh, who for spiritual or theological reasons were excluded from a community of faith. And so that's something we wrestle with uh, on an ongoing basis. And I know it's a shared experience uh, for open and affirming communities. We become a hospital uh, that hopefully seeks to rehabilitate people in their relationship with God. And what I encourage people to do at the outset is to begin to name the ways in which that they have been oppressed and marginalized um, and to name those things very openly and honestly, uh, as well as naming the hurt and rejection that they've experienced, um, because naming that is kind of the first step to healing and toward that reconciliation. I mean, then once those hurts and are named, learning to differentiate between um, God and the institutional church, the community of Christ in particular bodies of believers. Um, you know, we've all, uh, most of us have been hurt by churches, but to learn to not necessarily identify um, God with those elders or those pastors in the past who have hurt and to harm us. I mean, we do that by acknowledging that Christ stands with the oppressed, um, that in that experience, uh, it is God who is standing with uh, the marginalized person, the LGBTQI person, and celebrating their identity and bringing that to full development, growth, and fruition within the human life, and, and really celebrating the beauty and inherent dignity and worth of that queer person um, as being an integral part of the Christian community of faith. And so the last step with that is reclaiming that Christian identity um, of not allowing uh, oppressive and abusive faith communities to take that identity from you, to take that faith from you, uh, but to in a very uh, empowering, I think, and intentional way, uh, name that that uh, identity, whether it's Catholic or Christian or any faith tradition, is not something that anybody can take from you. Um, it's about your relationship with the divine or Christ or God or, or whatever name for God that you use or uh, transcendence. Uh, that is something that is unique to you and yours alone. Nobody can take that from you. And so that last step is about reclaiming that for yourself. Uh, and I think that can be very empowering for both the individual and for the community of faith. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, I think naming, you know, spiritual harm and, and spiritual abuse is, is really an important step because I think oftentimes we ask those who have been harmed, you know, to just try, try, try a different, try a different church, you know, try a different community and it'll be better. Um, and I think that's, that's asking a lot of somebody, um, to simply kind of try a different flavor, you know, um, sure. instead of, instead of really, really trying to do some, um, some real spiritual searching within, within, within oneself, um, because undoing harm takes time. Uh, I know that when I, uh, I, I suffered some pretty serious um, spiritual harm um, when I was younger that had to do with my sexuality and, and, and terms with, with that, with my relationship with God, well, mostly my relationship with the church. And um, when I wanted to go back to church and try a new, uh, try a new faith, a new community that was affirming, I thought it would be really easy because, well, I was going to an affirming church. Well, I found that when I actually got to the service, it was it was really hard to sit through a sermon because I kept waiting for the the, the pastor to say something negative about me and tell me I was doing something wrong. Yeah. Make me feel really bad. And it and it wasn't coming, but it was really anxiety inducing. And I ended up for the first few weeks of going to that church, having to step out during the sermon and then coming back um, for the, for the worship, which I like. And so um, it was a very interesting thing because I, I didn't think it would bother me so much, but it, it really did. Um, and so I think, you know, telling yourself, yes, it, it will take some time to, to undo some of the some of the things and and to name you're right name it was it was it actually your faith or the or the divine that was causing you this this issue or was it the space that you were in was it the words that were being used to you I think that's very powerful. Yeah, and that's, I think, an, an experience for a lot of people. You know, it's not just as easy as just going to the church down the road. Um, these are hurts that hurt on many levels, um, like sexual orientation, like sexual identity, like gender identity. Uh, our faith is rooted to who we are on an intrinsic level as a person. Uh, so when, in, uh, when we experience religious trauma, uh, when we experience a wound in that area of our life, that touches everything for us. Um, and so that healing is a long process. Uh, that grieving, that loss is a long process. I mean, just like when you grieve a, a, another type of relationship, moving into the next relationship doesn't fix everything, um, doesn't heal everything. Um, in fact, we tend to take some of those wounds, some of those hurts with us uh, into our, the next relationship. That's no less true uh, for a spiritual community. So I'm really glad to hear you say that because that's something we so often forget, uh, you know, that this is a process that oftentimes, you know, for us takes a lifetime, um, you know, to reconcile that relationship with God and with the church and also with our deepest, truest selves. Um, it really is a process. And, and what's nice about the community of faith and open and affirming communities like St. Jerome's is we get to go through that process together. Uh, we get to decide for ourselves what it means to be Christian or Catholic. Uh, we get to work through that reconciliation and to live out that reconciliation uh, in a variety of ways. Um, and so it really is a journey. Um, uh, what's nice about doing it with a community of faith is not having to journey alone, uh, but get, getting to journey uh, with, with Christ and with the church. And that the same would be said, you know, beginning, if you're Jewish, journeying with that Jewish community, you know, if you're Islamic, journeying with that Muslim community. Um, I think it's such a vital way of reclaiming that identity and, and moving toward healing uh, together as a community of faith. Absolutely. So two questions that are more geared specifically toward you. Um, so you are an out clergy person serving in your congregation. What has it been like to serve 
to serve your church and what perspective do you feel like you bring to the table? Yeah, so I've actually been lucky to serve in a variety of contexts. I have a very ecumenical uh, background. I've served in um, uh, Episcopal churches and lay ministry and disciples of Christ churches and in uh, what we call commissioned ministry. I've served um, in a community of Christ capacity before. And so I have a uh, worked in United Methodist Campus Ministry in just a variety of settings. And, um, and each community of faith was different uh, at being a queer person, being an out person, being a married person. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, I think being married and queer gives me such an, a different experience uh, of serving within a ministry within the church and, of course, serving within that wider community. Um, but having felt on the outside myself, having had to reconcile my faith and my sexual orientation uh, in the past myself has really given me, I hope, a richer experience of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a pastor. Uh, what it means to be made in the image of God. Um, I also hope that it gives me a sensitivity toward the needs and uh, of others uh, on their spiritual journey of healing and of reconciliation. And, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, being an out and uh, married uh, queer person, um, just my relationship alone and my relationship with the church is different uh, based on the fact that people know I have the same struggles as them, you know, I have the same, you know, family issues and, you know, uh, as them. And so I think it helps to humanize and to ground the clergy person uh, in the lived experience of their community of faith. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a gift from God uh, to be a queer clergy person, to be a married clergy person. Uh, it's who I am and it's who God called into ministry. Uh, and so being able to celebrate that and to acknowledge that and to live into that dual vocation um, as a queer married person and, and as a priest uh, the tension that's there animates my life and makes me a better priest, uh, hopefully a better husband and, and better son and better friend, um, and hopefully a manifestation in a small way um, of the great diversity uh, that exists within Christ Church and in the universal kingdom of God. My dog started barking. Oh, no. She stopped now. I didn't, I wanted to make Make sure she didn't bark over your your and your beautiful beautiful answer, which I do think I think it is absolutely the most brilliant thing. Put it on a shirt that it is a gift from God to be to be queer and serving. And I, I yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, what would you say to your younger self if you could go back in time? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I think I would say keep going. Um, so often, they're, they're, you know, growing up as a young queer person in Oklahoma, um, you know, uh, there are so many roadblocks and so many hurdles. So uh, the first thing I would say is keep going. Um, you know, put your head down and 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 push through. The second thing I would say is look around you and look at the support that you have. Um, I was very blessed to come from a wonderful supportive family and to be raised in a wonderful spiritual tradition and those resources, that support is out there. Um, and so I would encourage, the second thing I would say is I would encourage myself to make more use of that, to celebrate uh, the supportive peoples and communities in my life um, that as I grow older, will learn to appreciate and respect uh, more. There have been so many people in my life that helped me keep going, uh, that encouraged me to keep going when I was tempted to kind of give up or walk away from the church or, or surrender my vocation, um, which I can tell you is an ongoing process. So uh, the support is there, the love is there, the community is there. So uh, I would encourage myself to keep going, to be open to that community, to that support, and to risk the vulnerability it takes uh, to surrender one's life to, to the church and to the Christian community. Um, and that's really any, the same advice that I would offer any queer person who's struggling uh, with their faith tradition, whatever that tradition is, or struggling with their gender identity or sexual orientation, um, is, you know, to, to keep going, to uh, embrace the support in the community that's there, and to risk being vulnerable, uh, to be courageous in embracing uh, all of these things about you that makes you special um, and makes you a unique, particular, um, beautiful uh, imaging of God. Incredible advice. Um, I, yeah, 
great, great advice. <laughs> uh, so I, we want to end with, with um, really just talking about two um, pieces of legislation that kind of have to do with religion. And um, one is, is Oklahoma specific and one is, is a national bill. Um, the first one is an Oklahoma bill. And, and you know, hopefully this bill is going to, um, you know, die on the floor and, and it will not be taken to a vote. But it's important to talk about because um, it says a lot about Oklahoma. I, I think that the bill is even being written. So this bill would, would protect conversion therapy under the grounds of religious freedom. Mm. So it says that um, religious um, entities can should be able to practice and counselors should be able to practice conversion therapy or reparative therapy because um, it is their religious right. Mm. And, um, you know, that's an interesting take. Um, so what is your response to this bill as a religious leader? Yeah, uh, this bill is to me, especially troubling uh, because conversion therapy, just to speak unequivocally, is evil. Um, it is sin um, to, uh, to try and force someone, you know, who has been given a gift by God to relinquish that gift and embrace an identity that is foreign to them. Um, psychological study after psychological study uh, has proven that it's not only ineffective, but it is psychologically and emotionally and spiritually damaging to that individual. So first I would like to name that it is evil and that it is sin. Um, and it's even more troubling because it's evil and it's sin dressed up as holiness. Um, we know the, from even a cursory reading of Christian history that religion has been used to uh, subjugate women, uh, to uh, you know justify slavery, and now it's being used um, as a shield uh, in order to continue to oppress and, and marginalize uh, people on the queer spectrum, the LGBTIQA community. Um, and so uh, I think the one glimmer of hope in that is that uh, this is an obvious play to religion because ideologically this bill cannot stand on its own. Um, and so this false appeal to religion, this false appeal to faith, um, in a way concedes that uh, this bill uh, is really damaging um, and has no merit uh, on its own. And so uh, we've seen that throughout Christian history. Um, we've seen that up until today with this bill, the, the attempt to take scripture and, and misappropriate uh, it and mistranslate it, or to take Christian tradition or spirituality or, or one's relationship with God and the church uh, as justification for oppressing and marginalizing and essentially abusing uh, certain communities, uh, minority communities um, within you know, the Oklahoma and larger uh, national community. Um, and so I think we as, as people of faith or no faith at all can unite, we as clergy people, as religious leaders need to stand vocally in opposition to this and not only name it as evil, uh, not only name it as, as damaging and oppressive, um, but to reclaim uh, what it, you know, that, that religious um, identity of it, to call that idolatry, to call that um, baptizing this horrible bill as some kind of Christian crusade as being inherently and fundamentally false um, and actually robbing uh, the Oklahoma and queer community of the beautiful, beautiful and God-given diversity uh, that exists in, among, and through us. Absolutely. Um, and, and one important note that you, that you touched on, well, conversion therapy is considered religious abuse um, under the, under the, uh, under the category of religious abuse uh, as a idea <laughs> as something that you would go to counseling for you would you would you would get uh, you would seek counsel for uh conversion therapy is there um it is it does not work um it it, it is harmful it it hurts um it, it does not change you um and 20 states have outlawed conversion therapy and the District of Columbia, um, and 19 states are working on ending conversion therapy. Oklahoma is the only state working to protect mm. conversion therapy. And that, I think that is really saying something um, mm. about 
what our lawmakers think is really important. <laughs> And I believe that this is not Oklahoma. This is not what Oklahomans believe in. And um, one of the reasons we, we created Equality Faith and Love and that we're doing this program, Spirit, is because I really, I really believe that our spiritual community be believes that LGBTQ plus people are beautifully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no reason to even attempt to change a single cell in our body. Mm -hmm. um, and if week, week after week after week, we need to come on here and, and talk to, to you and, and explain that, mm -hmm. I will do it until the last day I breathe. Um, because I need everybody to know that there's nothing, 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 nothing wrong with you. And there are so many spiritual leaders here in, in Oklahoma that believe that. And in this country who believe that. And silly, silly laws that are, or bills rather, not laws, because this will not become law. Mm. Not, 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 not in my house. Um, that are trying to be passed like this is not a reflection of the Oklahoma that I know. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is why we do what we do. This is why we have these conversations. So I, I want to shift to um, the national level where actually something really exciting is happening. Yeah. We have a bill that, that, is, that is so, we're, we are standing on the precipice any day now, um, the Senate is going to pull it together and we're going to vote on this incredible act called the Equality Act. Um, what a thrilling name. Uh, the Equality Act, the most comprehensive LGBTQ plus protections um, act that would, that, would, that would help us nationwide. Border to border, state to state, we would get um, really comprehensive protections, including um, uh, business protections, um, healthcare protections, workplace protections, all sorts of incredible things um, to come with this bill. Uh, and really the main issue that is stemming from this bill is actually, again, coming from Oklahoma <laughs> senators, um, Langford uh, and, uh, Oh my goodness. Um, I forget his name. Um, Inhofe, Inhofe. Oh, Toby's gonna be so mad that I forgot his name for a second. Langford and Inhofe, um, they say this is an attack on religious freedom. And um, the concept of religious freedom is, is kind of complicated for, for everyone to understand. Um, and our, our, for our lawmakers to understand sometimes. And so um, when we talk about- I would about disagree a bit. I don't think it's that complicated. I think it's a bit misappropriated. Um, yeah, you know, take it uh, on, take it on, Father Joshua. Is the freedom to practice your own religion, not to force it on other people. Um, freedom of religion also means freedom from religion. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I, as a Catholic, I don't eat uh, fish on, or I only eat fish on Friday. I don't eat other meat. That doesn't give me the right to go around telling everybody else they cannot eat chicken nuggets on Friday. Uh, so that's not how freedom of religion works. That's not how it was conceived by the constitutional founders. And that's not how it is enshrined within law. So uh, I think it is quite simple. Uh, I think it's just being uh, manipulated and abused uh, by people who would like to uh, baptize their bigotry uh, in religious language and baptize their oppression um, as some weird form of false Christian oppression. Uh, and so I think that's something that we can all agree on, regardless of our religious affiliation or, or our lack thereof, uh, something that we can unite around and kind of stand in opposition to uh, things like the, the protection of conversion therapy, which is absurd and, and uh, you know, lack of support for this totally comprehensive and almost universal uh, equality bill. So, yeah, so I think I'm really glad to hear you name that and to, for us, uh, particularly, if, you know, for those of us who are clergy to be vocal about that. 
um, and to, you know, to kind of name that of saying, uh, this is what freedom of religion actually is and what it isn't. Um, because you're right, that's been totally co-opted um, by some, some uh, people within some political parties. So I'm glad that, that this is a platform where we're beginning as, as people of faith uh, to take that back and to say, no, that's not what that is. And no, that is not how that works. Absolutely. It is, it is imperative that um, religious leaders and religious people make a clear stance on what religious freedom is um, in America and what it has been defined to be. And um, especially when it comes to codifying the law for equality mm. for LGBTQ plus citizens in, in the United States. Because the same arguments, as you mentioned earlier, were used to try to, <laughs> were, try, were used to try to um, keep slavery. Mm. We're used to try to keep women from voting. We're used to try to keep, um, Segregation, mm -hmm. it is, this is not okay. And um, the more that we refuse to name it and say it and clarify what we know to be true, um, the more we, we, will, we will be manipulated. And, and we, we will not be manipulated because we do know um, what our rights are. And, um, Equality, not a bad word, and um, equality helps everyone. It does. Everyone, everyone. Yeah, and I think uh, that's another thing that we as, you know, progressive and, you know, uh, universal inclusive um, religionists can agree on is that, you know, separating church and state is not just good for the state, it's good for the church as well. Um, mm -hmm. It protects, you know, communities of faith as well. And and so anytime we can reclaim that language, you know, anytime we can, uh, like reclaiming the word queer is an empowering thing for many people. I'm reclaiming the word church and Christian from uh, people who would seek to abuse it and misappropriate it uh, is an empowering thing um, that speaks to the, to the power and testimony of faith and mm -hmm. of that queer community um, and, and of their ability to craft and uh, proclaim their narratives as they see fit. So. Um, I'm really glad you guys are doing this. That, this is really awesome. Um, it's really important in, in regards to the Equality Act. They still have not voted on it. Mm -hmm. Senators Langford and, um, and Inhofe have stated they will refuse to vote yes on the Equality Act because it is in opposition to religious freedom. Um, I, I believe it is important to um, tell them that this is not in opposition to religious freedom and that um, mm -hmm. as as somebody who is LGBTQ plus and, and a religious person, it is important to me that they vote that they vote yes on the Equality Act Absolutely. and that it is not a violation of my religious rights. Right. And um, if you feel similarly, I really encourage you to uh, to contact your legislators. Um, you can do so online. Um, if you go on any of our Facebook pages, so if you're watching this right now, you're on one of them. <laughs> Uh, you can scroll down and you can find uh, a way to contact your legislator. You can call their office. You can email them. Um, you can tweet at them. You can Instagram them. You can Facebook message them. But by golly, let's let them know that we yeah. really want them to vote yes. And um, and we want this bill to pass with a sweep across the nation. Um, and so we can celebrate knowing that Oklahoma did what was right. Um, and so we can celebrate, we can celebrate this humongous victory. Um, Father Joshua, do you want, do you want to say anything else about um, anything? <laughs> sure. Yeah, the last thing would be my call to, you know, people of all faith, um, you know, of all faiths who are watching this and who may see this later. Um, we are called by uh, the divine, by God, by the transcendent, by life, if you will, uh, to be prophetic you know, to speak against injustice, to speak against evil, 
um, that was that is the core of so many religious traditions and and so many um, you know ideologies or philosophies. And so, uh, if we are not you know living into that prophetic call to stand up for the oppressed, to stand up for the marginalized, we are fall, falling short of our call as human beings and as people of faith. And so, um, I would just encourage my clergy brothers and sisters and and uh, lay people uh, from all religious traditions to name that and to claim that identity, uh, that mantle of prophet, and to stand you know, boldly and firmly uh, for equality, for justice, uh, and for equal protection under the law. Um, it is not a partisan issue. Uh, this, is a, this is a faith issue. Uh, this is a human rights issue. Um, and so we can stand united regardless of our religious affiliation or none uh, and in fighting for that, for that, for that justice and for that equality that I believe is inevitable, that I believe uh, is our future, uh, and will someday uh, we'll look back hopefully uh, and celebrate uh, this year and, and the passing of that monumental law. Absolutely. Um, if you are, if you heard the, if you heard Father Joshua's call and you would like to join. Um, our, our call for spiritual leaders to um, step forward and affirm LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, you can do so by um, going to okeq.org um, and clicking on alliances and joining the Equality Faith Alliance. Um, it, it's totally free to do so. And um, you can just, you can, if you are a member of a congregation and you want to nominate a church, you can do so um, there. And if you are a, a employee or, or a clergy person from a church, you can also sign your own church up on that site. Um, if you would like to be featured in one of our spirit um, conversations, you can also uh, get info there on how to do that as well. Um, Father Joshua, do you wanna talk about how people can find out more about St. Jerome's? Sure, absolutely. So uh, like everybody else, we're on Facebook. Uh, you can find us there. Uh, we do stream our services there. Uh, Sundays, at, our primary service is on Sunday at 11 o'clock. Uh, we are worshiping in person and online. Uh, so you're welcome to join us. We are located in the Heights District or the Heights neighborhood just north of downtown at 205 West King. Uh, so you're welcome to join us in person on Sunday at 11. Uh, we also stream our service via Facebook Live. So you can find us on Facebook. Um, and you can find our website to learn a little more about us at stjerometulsa.org. Uh, so we'd be glad to have you, be glad to welcome you, be glad to answer any questions that you have. Um, and, you know, that that's pretty much it. Uh, you can find us in all the traditional places. Uh, and we truly are a diverse, welcoming, affirming community of faith. And we'd be glad to journey with you uh, as you as you move through life. Well, it's been such a pleasure talking with you tonight, Joshua. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I hope everybody else enjoyed it too. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section or um, you can send me an email, morgan.allen at okeq.org, or you can just find us online at okeq.org. Have a great night, everybody.